Hi, everybody. Welcome. We'll get we'll wait a few more minutes and let folks sign in. Feel free to unmute yourself and say hi and introduce yourself, or you can drop a note in the chat saying where you're coming from or what brought you here today. And thank you all for being here. Hi, hi, Margaret and the team. This is Razia Mianor. I'm a beginning farmer in Gilroy. Great. Thank yeah, you for thank coming. You. Thank you. And I also make barn owl boxes that I have installed on my farm. I don't know. My question would be, how do we attract the owls to occupy those boxes? <laughs> I won't be talking about barn owls today, but oh. um, there are a bunch of ways that you can do it, thinking about like the position of it, the height, the orientation. Yeah. Um, there's a professor at Cal Poly Humboldt, Matt Johnson, who has a huge research program on those um, oh. and has put out a bunch of guidance on that as well. So Google his name and you'll okay. find some good good stuff on that. <laughs> thank you. Lots of work in vineyards on, on barn owls. Oh, thank you so much. Mm hmm. Yeah. And if you email any of um, your local farm advisor or two or any of us, we can send along more information. Thank you. Okay, it is 12.02, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So welcome, everybody. We're so happy to have you here for another week of the Organic Seminar Series. I'm Margaret Lloyd, and I'm the Organic Agriculture and Small Farms Advisor covering Yolo, Solano, and Sacramento counties. And this organic seminar series has been going on for a few years now, and it's a collaboration between several advisors, including Aparna Gazula, Lucy Diekman, Hong Doan, and others um, in the Small Farms Network uh, in UC Cooperative Extension. And we are especially lucky to have Alba join us to help with Spanish interpretation. So um, be sure to check out the Spanish channel if uh, you would like to listen to the talk in Spanish. We also record the uh, seminar, so you can listen to it at a later time or share it with others. Before we start, please keep yourself muted. We will have time at the end of the talk for questions, and uh, we will also monitor the chat and address things that come up in the chat at the end of um, the presentation. So because we uh, receive fun federal funds to run our programs, we're required to report on demographics and it's important that these are self-reported. So if you could please take a minute to um, complete this poll, we would be really grateful. We have a few um, great talks coming up in the following weeks. Next week, we'll have Jesse Beckett or Adrian Fisher from CCOF talking about organic certification, some of the new regulations, and also grant opportunities for folks who want to transition to organic farming. Then on March 5th, we'll have a talk by Peter Henry from the USDA on disease suppression in soil. And then we have two talks on nitrogen acquisition in organic production. Uh, first on March 12th by Joji Muramoto, and then March 19th by Wei Ching Cheng. And our last talk of the season is March 26th by Philip Wyson, a cooperative extension advisor on integrating root exudate and reduced risk nematicides for vegetable production. But today we have the great pleasure of having Danny Karp. He's a associate professor in the Department of Wildlife, Fish and Conservation Biology at UC Davis. His interests center on developing methods for harmonizing food production with that of conservation, ecosystem services and biodiversity. 
He completed his PhD in 2013 and has a BS from Stanford University. After his PhD, Danny worked as a Nature Net Science Fellow at the Nature Conservancy and UC Berkeley. He was then awarded a Killam Postdoctoral Fellowship to conduct research at the University of British Columbia before joining faculty at UC Davis. So thank you so much, Danny, for coming today and presenting on the great challenging of co-managing California produce fields for food safety, pest control, and bird conservation. All right, before we get started really quick, uh, Margaret, could you make me the host? Because only the host can facilitate the um, translation room. Oh, okay. Um, yes. Sorry about that. No problem. All right. Well, thank you so much, Margaret, uh, for that introduction and for having me here. I'm really excited to chat with you all today. I see a lot of familiar names in the virtual room here and apologize, I'm apologizing to those who are really familiar and have seen this talk probably multiple times before. Hopefully I don't bore you too much. But for the rest of you guys, it's new. Hopefully I can show you guys some interesting ideas, perspectives about how we can co-manage our produce farms uh, for multiple objectives. So starting off, let's kind of start with that foodborne disease outbreak that I'm sure everyone in the room knows about or has heard about or really influenced their lives. This is that one from 2006 where there was an E. coli outbreak in bagged spinach traced back to California's central coast where most of the leafy greens are grown for the United States. And it was found in the water and in the soil of one farm, the, the strain that was responsible for this outbreak. But it was also found in the feces of cattle and wild pigs. And the pigs were the kicker because it led industry to believe that wildlife were responsible for bringing these foodborne diseases onto farm fields. And ever since then, ever since 2006, there's been a lot of pressure on growers, including many of the folks in this room, to do everything that they can to keep wildlife out of their farms. So we see this transformation in the way that agriculture is done in California and actually beyond California as well, where now we see these rodent traps that are lining the farm edges. They're going to be filled with either snap traps or anticoagulant rodenticides. We see fencing going up. Much of the Salinas River is now fenced, which could disrupt wildlife movements, prevent some of those larger animals from getting onto the farm fields. And then most critically, from my perspective, what we're going to be talking talking about today is the creation of these bare ground buffers, the removal of natural or semi-natural habitat around farm fields. Right after the outbreak, uh, between 2006 to 2009, about 13 percent of the remaining riparian vegetation along the Salinas River was cleared directly as a result of that outbreak. We conducted a survey several years later in 2015 and found that about 40% of California produce growers were still clearing vegetation. And this is a practice that actually continues up until today with the rationale being that if you remove this vegetation around your farm fields, you're basically removing the habitat of these animals that might come into your farm fields and spread foodborne pathogens. So many years ago now, um, I got really interested in this topic and wanted to know, you know, is this practice effective? Is it effective to remove habitat around farm fields? And what could be some of the costs of doing so? So the first thing that I did many years ago now um, was began partnering with some large leafy greens organizations in the Central Coast and got my hands on some data. In fact, 240,000 tests of Entrero hemorrhagic coli and salmonella in leafy greens across 74 farms spanning the years 2007 to 2013. We also got a data set on indicator or generic E. coli in water, in wells and waterways, uh, about 7,000 tests across 484 farms. Um, now, whether E. coli, indicator E. coli correlates with pathogenic E. coli, that's, there's a lot of discussion and debate about that, but we can look at these data as well. And then we had a smaller data set of salmonella in rodents, about 800 tests on nine farms conducted by a PhD student from 2007 to 2009. And the very simple thing that I wanted to do was figure out where these tests were located, where were you testing these products or the water or the rodents, and ask, what did the habitat look like around 
those testing sites. So if we could imagine a circle, a radius of 1.5 kilometers around a given testing location, what fraction of that area is cropland, is other natural types of vegetation, uh, riparian areas, water, and then critically grazed land. And the grazed land is really important because we know that E. coli came out of confined animal feedlots is really associated with livestock. So we would expect, and lots of other studies have shown, that if you have more grazed land around, then you might have higher incidences of E. coli on the farm. So very simple association, what did we find? Well, if we look at the enterohemorrhagic E. coli, the kind of E. coli that gets you sick in leafy greens, you show that there was no effect of cropland. Here you can see the effect is basically zero here. The grazable land did have a positive effect. You can see that this dot and confidence intervals are above zero. So more grazed area meant a higher likelihood of, test, of your product testing positive for EHEC. And we saw no significant effect of riparian vegetation or other natural habitat. You can see these confidence lines cross zero. If anything, they would be the kind of mean estimates is below zero. So if anything, it would be a negative effect, but can't really confidently say that. When we looked at our other outputs or other metrics, we also saw no effect of ungrazed habitat, be it riparian or other natural habitat on the E. coli in water or on the salmonella in leafy greens. But what was even cooler about that data set was that it was temporal. Remember, we had these years of E. coli tests on farms. So we could ask on the farms that removed more habitat or didn't remove as much habitat, what was the change in E. coli over time? And what we found was pretty interesting. We found that the farms that removed more habitat, that's these areas here on the left of the graph, the ones that have a bigger negative number indicating a greater decrease in E. coli in, um, habitat over time, those farms that removed more habitat actually saw a greater increase in enterohemorrhagic E. coli over time. So exactly the opposite of what you might have hypothesized. You might be looking at this point up here and thinking to yourselves, well, is this driving everything? If you remove it, it's still a significant trend, but there's a lot of scatter here. So when I present this graph, I often like to say that, you know, our confidence that having habitat around is a good thing, eh, hard to say based on this kind of graph. But certainly through no stretch of the imagination could you swap this graph and make it be a positive relationship. It's clearly negative, if anything. So certainly you don't see the case that removing this habitat makes things safer from a food safety perspective. And if anything, habitat removal is likely increasing food safety risks. So this was the first project I ever did on food safety and what, where I began actually working in California in the Central Coast. But it didn't tell us about you know, the role of wildlife, right? It could be that removing habitat was not effective, for instance, because it didn't affect wildlife movements at all, and wildlife were still a risk factor. And in fact, after having a bunch of conversations with growers and actually formal interviews and surveys with growers, they expressed a lot of concern in particular about birds. So for example, here's a quote from a grower in the Central Coast that said, the thing that worries me more actually are birds. You can't control birds and they're constantly like flying over your fields. They come and sit in the field and they carry salmonella. And that's true, right? We do see foodborne pathogens occasionally in birds and you can't fence out the birds. So they might be a problem, but we didn't really know. And so if we take a step back and we think about the role of birds on farms, we can see that birds actually do a lot of different things. Some of them good, some of them potentially bad, right? So we have birds coming on to our fields and potentially pooping on them, contaminating things like strawberries, which could be a problem. We also see birds coming in and consuming the products that we grow. So birds like strawberries just like we do, and they might be damaging our products, not only strawberries, other crops as well. But we know that birds eat other things besides our crops. They, for example, might be eating some of the insects that in turn eat our crops. So we have this picture here of a barn swallow that might be eating the strawberry pest Ligus hesperus and therefore providing some sort of biological control, pest control. But could, it could even get more complicated than that, right? The barn swallow might not discern between good bugs and bad bugs, and so they could actually disrupt pest control if they eat the good bugs, like this big-eyed bug that in turn eats 
the bad bugs, like this Lycus asparagus here. That process is called intraguild predation. And so we were really interested in thinking about birds holistically and all of the different ways, therefore, that they sort of engage with farms and impact growers. So what we're going to do today is we're going to seek to answer three questions about the role of birds on farms, and we're going to emphasize the food safety bit a bit. Okay, we'll start off by asking which bird species, if any, carry food safety risks. All right, then we're going to come back to this habitat question and ask how does habitat on and off the farm affect birds and then what does that mean in terms of food safety risks. And then we'll broaden and think about some of these other roles that birds might play on farms and ask what the implications are of habitat management and bird communities for pest control and crop damage and we'll focus mostly on strawberries for that last part. So that's our task for today. Let's get at it. All right, so first, which bird species carry food safety risks? So when we think about the role of a bird on a farm and its potential risk of carrying pathogens, we can think about this whole spillover process. We first ask, does this species carry a pathogen of interest? If it really doesn't, then we don't need to worry about it. If it does, then we have to ask, all right, is this a bird that we can see around a farm but doesn't actually come in contact with our produce? If it doesn't come in contact with our produce, we don't need to worry about it. But if it is coming on our farm and in particular defecating on the produce, then we need to ask ourselves, all right, how well do these bacteria, these E. coli, salmonella survive in bird poop? Is it just for like a couple hours, a couple days, a couple of weeks, or is it a very long time? If it doesn't survive for much time at all, then maybe we don't need to worry about that as much. But if it survives for a while up until harvest time, then we might have a higher risk of spillover, okay? So we need to think about all of these steps along this chain. So let's start off with the prevalence and the kind of interactions between birds and crops. So to get at this question, we compiled three data sets. The first was a data set of pathogen prevalences, of tests of uh, STEC or Shiga toxin producing E. coli, that's the kind that often gets you sick, then Salmonella, and then Campylobacter. Campylobacter is another disease um, that birds carry. It's indigenous in bird guts. Um, and we had 11,000 tests from a bunch of different studies, from five different studies, some of which we conducted, some of which others conducted, across 90 produce farms and 95 bird species in the Western US. Then we had a database of bird point counts of locations where we would go out and look at birds, 1,500 different locations across, uh, or 1,500 counts across 350 sites where we were looking at the birds, seeing what they were doing on farms and whether they were interacting with produce. And then the last kind of cool thing we did was we got this data set of bird poops that were collected on farms, about 500 of them across 35 farms. And then we would use DNA analysis to figure out who was the culprit, who was that bird that was pooping on that farm, okay? So we had these data sets. And first off, we just want to know how common are these pathogens in birds? Well, from our analysis of that data set, we found that STEC or Shiga toxin producing E. coli was super rare, only 0.2% of birds tested positive. Salmonella, also incredibly rare, about 0.5%. But Campylobacter was a bit more common. 8% of birds tested positive. And a big caveat here, there's still a lot of debate about whether the strain of Campylobacter that birds carry and that sort of native to bird guts is the same kind that actually gets us sick. There's actually some evidence to suggest that they may be distinct lineages. So keep that in the back of your mind as we go forward. Recently, we just completed another study funded by the Center for Produce Safety where we added a bunch more tests, about 550 tests focusing on undersampled birds. And the numbers changed just a tiny bit. STEC remained at 0.2%. Salmonella dropped a little bit to 0.4%. And Campylobacter dropped a bit more to 5.8% with this larger data space. So we can't really analyze much in the way of STEC and Salmonella. It's just rare that you know very, very few birds are testing positive. But for Campylobacter, we could ask, what kinds of birds are most likely to carry it? And we found that species that associate with livestock that you can see in confined animal feedlots sometimes or around livestock and rangeland, they were more likely to first carry Campylobacter. Here on the y-axis, you see the probability of detecting Campylobacter. That's higher if the bird is livestock associated versus if it isn't. Those kinds of birds are also more likely to be found contacting produce. So we would observe them sort of interacting with 
produce, you can see it's much higher um, for livestock associated species than ones that are not. And then lastly, the number of feces sort of attributed back to birds, you can see that those livestock associated species were much more likely to be actually defecating on the crops, okay? So that was the first step there. The next thing that we wanted to do was look at survival, all right? Survival of these pathogens in bird poop. So what we did here is we conducted an experiment where we would grow E. coli in the lab. Now this is a strain that came from a lettuce field initially was thought to be pathogenic, but then was later realized not to be pathogenic. And that is very important because I'm gonna go put this strain of E. coli out in the student farm here at UC Davis. And certainly they don't want us putting out pathogens on the student farm. So a non-pathogenic version of E. coli, we would grow it in the lab. Then we would go out in the field and collect a bunch of bird poop. There's an odd amount of my research in my lab that focuses on bird poop. You'll see that throughout this talk today. So we collect all this bird poop, we would inoculate it with set concentrations of E. coli, and then we would put it in the field and come back at set times to quantify the fraction remaining. And so we would put that on soil, on plastic mulch that you would find in a strawberry field, on lettuce as well, and we would use different bird species and different sizes of poops. Unsurprisingly, we found that survival of E. coli was higher on lettuce compared to on the soil or in the plastic mulch. And we put out some data loggers and showed that it indeed is cooler and more humid on that lettuce, better growing conditions for the E. coli. What was even more interesting across this experiment and then several other ones that we did in the lab though, was that we found that much more so than the identity of the bird per se, it was the size of the poop that really mattered and determined pathogen survival. So here you can see a graph, for example, looking at the number of the days in the field. And on the y-axis, we have the detection probability of E. coli. So this is like a highly, uh, like, sensitive tests, can we find any amount of the E. coli we originally put out, yes or no? And we see that, you know, in the beginning, you have relatively high detection probability, these numbers go down over time, but they go down a lot faster if you have these smaller poops, the 0.03 grams, which is the size of like a, a you know, small warbler, 0.06 grams, which is the size of a bluebird, those didn't differ at all jump up to two grams, the size that it turns out to be of a juvenile turkey, a baby turkey, and you can see it's a bit higher, and then go to an adult turkey at 4.75 grams, and you see the detection probability barely goes down over time. What about the fraction of it remaining? Well, that does go down a lot across the board, but again, you can see that the, the turkey had a lot higher fraction remaining in the beginning. Um, so size really mattered. Why am I so fixated on the size of poops? Well, farmers are told to apply no harvest buffers around wildlife feces. Often it's said to be a meter around all the wildlife feces they find in the fields. We conducted more than 100 bird fecal transects on lettuce farms, found about 10% of them had, 10% of the one meter quadrats that we assessed had a bird poop in it. So kind of rough guess, if farmers are following these guidances, then maybe they'd be forced to disc about 10% of their field, which is pretty crazy. When we did this on strawberry farms, it's even more nuts. It's about 50% of those one meter squared quadrats around bird feces. So that's clearly infeasible. But what if we were to ignore all of the feces that were deposited on the soil where it's worse for survival and by small birds as opposed to large birds. Well, if you were to ignore those ones and only put the no harvest buffers around like large poops on the product on lettuce, for example, you would find that that would reduce the affected area from 10% to 2.7% of farm fields. So it actually could be a really big change in terms of targeting where the risk matters a bit more. So to conclude from this section, what have we learned? We found that higher risk species would be these large birds that poop larger poops like this common raven here, um, which also is livestock associated. You can find that around livestock and forms big flocks. So higher risk species comparatively. Low risk species would be smaller birds 
insect eating birds were lower risk, including birds that use nest boxes. So putting out nest boxes for bluebirds and tree swallows is really a low risk activity. We actually didn't see any pathogens ever detected across those databases in the, these bluebirds or tree, swall tree swallows, which are the primary birds you find in these nest boxes. Cool. All right, so we know a little bit about bird species and food safety risks now. What about habitat? How does habitat affect the birds? How does that affect the food safety risks? Let's move on to that. So for this, we have two different studies. One was across 20 organic strawberry farms. The other was across 20 organic lettuce farms surveyed per year from the years 2018 to 2020. And we were really purposeful about the types of farms we were selecting to work on for this study because we wanted to have some independent variation in first the local diversity. So that's like how many crops you're growing, whether you've got non-crop vegetation like hedgerows or flower strips or things like that in your farm field, all within kind of the local farm environment. Then we also wanted them to vary in the amount of that ungrazed natural habitat around the farm field within a kilometer. And then also in the grazed habitat within a kilometer, remember we know that grazed habitat might be a little bit more risky from a food safety perspective. For the strawberry study, we were actually capturing birds, collecting the poop directly from them, and then asking them for foodborne pathogens. And for the lettuce study, we were doing bird counts to figure out what birds were on these farms, and then just collecting the lettuce, uh, the feces from the lettuce. So we won't know which are the species that were defecating on the lettuce in that case. So let's start off with the strawberry study. First, I'll note that in terms of directly touching the strawberry, there were only two feces out of more than 10,000 or sorry, only two strawberries of more than 10,000 strawberries that we looked at across this project that had bird poop physically touching them. That said, we know that irrigation can sort of spread the, the poop around. And so we might still be concerned, not just if it's touching the, the strawberry itself. All right, what about our positivity rates? Out of nearly 1,000 feces captured, uh, from captured birds, we had 0.1% test positive for STEC, 0% for salmonella, um, and 3.6 for Campylobacter. So we couldn't do much in the way of analyzing STEC or, or Salmonella, it was too rare. But for Campylobacter, what was really interesting was that we showed that if you look at the amount of that semi-natural habitat around the farm field, that's on the x-axis here, greater fractions of that habitat around the farm field actually meant that it was less likely for a bird to test positive for Campylobacter. You can see a negative relationship here. So birds are less likely to carry Campylobacter on farms with more surrounding habitat. Why would that be? Well, we've got some ideas. Let's look at the lettuce study for some insights, all right? So first, for the lettuce study, we collected 600 feces from lettuce farms. None of them tested positive for STEC or Salmonella. 5.7% of them tested positive for Campylobacter. We wanted to analyze that Campylobacter data as well as a few other types of data and look at the landscape associations. And so what we decided to do was label a poop as potentially pathogenic if it tested positive for Campylobacter. Remember, we don't know that this is the same strain that affects people. Or if it tested positive for E. coli virulent genes. What does this mean? Well, there are genes in E. coli that produce the toxin that get you sick, the Shiga toxin, and none of them in this case had those genes. So none of these E. coli's that we would have found would have gotten people sick. But there are also genes that dictate whether the E. coli can like adhere to your cells and things like that that are sort of associated with pathogenicity. You need them to adhere to your cells and then deposit that toxin, right? And some of those birds did test positive for those, you know, adhesion genes. So we're just going to be super conservative and label any feces that test positive for any of these virulence genes or Campylobacter as potentially pathogenic. And then look at the local diversification, the habitat around the farm fields. What do we find? No effect of local diversification at all. So no effect of having hedgerows or things like that. No effect of the ungrazed semi-natural habitat around the farm field. If anything, it might be slightly negative, but not significantly so. 
And sure enough, we saw that more grazed areas around the farm field did have a higher density of these potentially pathogenic feces. So grazed habitats around farm fields had a slightly higher food safety risk from birds, but ungrazed habitats did not. So let's get back to all of these trends and try to understand what's driving them. And to do that, we need to look at how the bird communities change. So the first thing that we can do is look at the number of bird species that we find on these farms during our counts. That's called the species richness, the diversity of birds. And we find that that very slightly increases with the local diversification. It's significant. It's not a huge increase, but it's a significant one. So you get a few more bird species on farms that have hedgerows and things like that. And we didn't see too much in the way of changing the identities of the birds, changing the composition of birds. So we're looking at that on the y-axis as the conservation value of these birds. So think of that as like we survey all these birds at a given place. Each one of these has a score as to how sort of threatened and endangered and declining it is where uh, oak titmouse right here would be of higher conservation value than like this starling down here that is an invasive species that we don't care as, about as much. No relationship with local diversification. But with the, you know, ungrazed semi-natural habitat around farm fields, we see something different. We see more ungrazed semi-natural habitats meant a uh, much more diverse bird community and a shift in the kinds of birds that were present towards those that were dominated more by these birds of higher conservation value. So the ungrazed semi-natural habitats were promoting these birds of higher conservation concern. What was most critical from the food safety perspective was what were the kinds of birds that were on the farms that didn't have this ungrazed semi-natural habitat. And those were dominated often by these big flocking birds. So if we look at the probability of observing a bird flock, during our counts at seven or more individuals of the same species, we see that goes down as you increase the amount of ungrazed semi-natural habitat around the farm field. You're changing your community from one dominated by, you know, lots of these big flocking birds that might be associated with higher food safety risks, uh, might associate with livestock, like those blackbirds and starlings, to one that has a lot more species, including these species of higher conservation concern, all right? So big flocks of birds less likely to occur on farms with more surrounding ungrazed habitat. All right, so we spent a lot of time talking about food safety. What about crop damage? What about the other roles that birds play on farms? So let's go back to the strawberry study a little bit and talk about that. Now, remember I told you we were capturing birds around these farm fields. So we would put up these nets, these fine nets called mist nets. Birds run into them. They don't notice that they're there and they get all tangled up. We check them really regularly and then we are trained and permitted to, to carefully get them out of their nets and put them in these sterile cloth bags that we use to transport them to a place that we can look at the birds and identify them and, and do all the things we need to do. Now the bird gets in this cloth bag and it freaks out a little bit. And you know what it does? It poops. And that poop is what we care about. That's what we really want and we use. So like 90% of the time the birds will poop. So we can get that poop out of the bag, put it in a vial, and then use DNA sequencing techniques to figure out what the bird was eating. Were they eating insects? What kind of insects? Were they eating plants? What kind of plants? As I said before, we had about a thousand fecal samples that we were testing. Um, these are the same poops that we were testing for pathogens as well across about 50 species. So we did all this work and we found, lo and behold, a lot of these bird species were indeed consuming insect pests. All of the species I have here um, on this slide, we found evidence that they were eating the primary pests of strawberries, this Ligus asparagus right here. And so celebration, birds are doing great things for farmers, great. But then we looked at our other results and found that all of these species on this slide were also consuming strawberries. And in fact, they were also consuming our beneficial bugs as well. So birds were doing all of these things, right? All right. So let's look and see, maybe it's the case that they're doing more of some of these things on some farms relative to other farms. Let's take a look at that. So we compared farms with and without semi-natural habitat around the farm field. 
we find that farms without habitat around the farm field, birds were more likely to test positive for strawberries, for beneficial bugs, and for pest insects. And farms without habitat around the farm field were less likely to test positive for all three of these things. And this could be confirmed with some independent analyses. For example, we would go along and look for evidence of bird damage to strawberries. We would call this flick damage because birds will often like take a peck of a strawberry and then flick the seeds around the mulch. And so we could know that was a bird. And you can see as we have more habitat around the farm field, the likelihood of observing direct damage from birds declines here. So what all of this is telling us is that that habitat around the farm field was sort of reducing overall feeding activity on the farm. They're not eating the strawberries as much. They're not eating the beneficial bugs as much, which is good, but they're also not eating the pests as much. So maybe they're just eating more in that habitat around the farm fields. So then on balance, are birds good or bad? Well, we can't really know that just by looking at their poops. We need to conduct an experiment. So we did an experiment. We would exclude birds from strawberry plants with these mesh net cages. And then we would have these open control plants next door and we would monitor them weekly for berry damage and for insect abundance. We had three pairs of these cages across 14 farms. And we would then see what the effect of excluding birds was, right? We found that insects damaged way, 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 way more berries than birds. So insects were way more of a problem overall than birds. That said, the net effect of birds, when you factor in birds eating the strawberries, birds eating beneficial bugs, birds eating pests, the net effect overall was slightly negative, about a 3.5% loss in yield associated with birds. And that is likely due to both that bird damage and them consuming beneficial bugs, all right? But the story is not over yet because we also want to know how farm management affects that net effect. And we could use our models to kind of look at this and play with alternative scenarios. So imagine we have this farm with a bunch of surrounding habitat. We can see it right here around the farm field, these hedgerows. If we were to zoom out to a kilometer, you'd see in the landscape a lot more habitat, all right? We could map this out in terms of the cost impact of birds per meter squared, and you see it's slightly negative basically everywhere across this farm. If we look at a different farm, this is one that does not have much habitat around it or in the landscape if we were to zoom out, you see a bit different dynamics. Along the edges of the farm field, you see these areas that have a lot of damage from birds. These are areas that are getting hammered by big flocks of like these, these finches and other things coming in and eating a lot of strawberries. But in the middle of the field, surprisingly, we actually see a positive effect of birds. And this is where we would often see swallows swooping down and potentially eating some of these pest insects, all right? But again, what those models, we can pose alternative scenarios. So what if we were to take this farm that, you know, didn't have much habitat around it and move it into the category of this farm and basically add 50% habitat to the landscape? Well, then we would see about a 25% decrease in the costs associated with birds. Conversely, if we were to take this farm right here and deforest all of that habitat around, remove all that vegetation, then you would see our models predict about a 75% increase in costs associated with birds. So at least in this case, in strawberries in the central coast, this surrounding habitat is mitigating the costs associated with wild birds. All right, so to wrap up everything that we've covered today and give us at least a little bit of time for questions, what did we learn? First, pathogen prevalence in birds is super low. And that's really important to take away. For the two main things that people care about, the pathogenic E. coli and the salmonella, it's ridiculously rare in these birds on farm fields. Birds that are larger, that are associated with livestock, that form big flocks, they might be comparatively higher risk, um, but just a little bit so. The small pest eating birds, the insect eating ones that use nest boxes would be the lowest risk, okay? So that means you could probably put out those nest boxes around your farm fields without too much of a problem. We see no harvest buffers around small feces might not be needed. And that's because the pathogen die off is pretty fast in those small feces, especially if they are on plastic or on soil. And if you were able to ignore those small feces, 
then that would dramatically reduce the area that would be subject to these no harvest buffers in farm fields, which is really important. And then lastly, with respect to the non-crop vegetation, at least in California, we see removing non-crop vegetation would likely harm these bird species of conservation concern. It would increase cross crop damage, at least to strawberries, and it would not improve food safety. And this is a finding that has been replicated, the food safety part of it, um, in many other systems now across the United States. So there's been work in Northeastern US and looking at tests of E. coli, Listeria, Salmonella in water. There's work in the South of the United States as well. All of it sort of aligning and not showing any evidence that that non-crop vegetation is a risk factor as far as food safety goes. So with that, I'd like to thank all of my co-authors. I'd also really like to thank a lot of the growers and landowners that have been involved in this project, uh, including some people actually in the, in the room right now. We've had some really great funding from the National Science Foundation from the United States Department of Agriculture and the Center for Produce Safety. Thank all you guys for listening and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Danny. That was a fantastic presentation. What incredible research. Wow. Okay, let's have some questions. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. You can drop your question in the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a question in the chat. Um, yeah. Pam writes, um, I wanted to ask you about the last slide and the three points. Are those relevant to birds only or other species? Okay. So yeah, great question, Pam. Thanks for that. Um, so let's go to that one. The so let's start with the first one. Which species are going to be of higher risk? I don't know about that for other species. We've only done that really specifically looking at birds. So I wouldn't say that, you know, livestock associated like gregarious larger mammals are higher risk than smaller risk ones. I mean, it might be the case. I just, I don't know. Um, no harvest buffers around small feces. So we're now thinking about like, you know, rodent or mammal feces or things like that. Again, um, I don't know what the answer is there. The mechanism we think of what's going on has to do with like the desiccation rate of these feces. Um, so I would imagine that it would maybe end up being a similar story for mammal poops as bird poops there. But again, the, you know, I don't know of any science to evaluate that. So that's a, that's a cognitive leap to go. As far as the non-crop vegetation part of the equation, um, Certainly we know that non-crop vegetation can benefit a variety of taxa, including birds, but other ones as well. Um, there's lots of sort of evidence to suggest habitat around farm fields can either increase or decrease crop damage from other organisms. So that one is probably not generalizable. Um, it depends on the species that you're looking at, the pest you're looking at for pest damage. And for food safety, as I said, there's been no study to date that has shown um, non-crop vegetation to be a significant risk factor that I am aware of. And there are now an accruing number of them from our lab, from other labs around the US showing that um, the opposite is true, basically. Yeah. Great, thank you. Another question is asking, in light of these findings, have you seen any changes for growers, food safety guidelines or requirements adjacent to cattle grazing operations? Yeah, I mean, my work sort of is just one in a giant literature looking at the kind of interplay between rangeland cattle operations and produce, right? Um, so we basically, the way I would frame our work, that we're basically finding the same sort of things that other people find there. And there's a lot of work that's been focused on that and thinking about setbacks and what kinds of produce should be grown next to these operations, ideally nest not as sensitive produce. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't say that like our work is at all groundbreaking in that respect and sort of dictating policy as much as we focus on the, the more natural habitats. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself or um, feel free to drop in more questions. I have a question for you, Danny. Yeah. Um, Although the presence of these pathogens is already low in a lot of these species, what do yeah. you think is the role of 
the um you know the location of the feces and maybe the management practices like if it's on plastic if the feces are on plastic versus bare ground versus ground that has you know higher microbial activity from compost additions or things like that so yeah how does the role of some of these on farm practices change the rate of degradation of any of these yeah. pathogens well so yeah so we know from the from the survival standpoint that we just studied, right? That like survival um, and persistence is higher on crops, on the lettuce than it would be on soil or on plastic, because I think it just dries out and gets really hot, right? Mm -hmm. That makes good sense. Um, we had originally thought we were going to test out and look at like organic versus conventional soil as well, but we did all of this work on the this, on an organic field and we couldn't bring in conventional soil without them losing their, uh, you know, their organic status. So we couldn't actually do that experiment. There is some evidence. Um, we, there was a one study that we did in the past that looked at survival of these pathogens in uh, soils that had been cover cropped versus not and composted versus not and found some evidence that you kind of created a more uh, pathogen resistant bacterial community that could suppress these pathogens when you did things like put in compost. That was one study though, and it's a bit preliminary. So I think the jury's still out on some of that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, thank you. Corey, I see your hand is raised. Why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself? Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Annie. That's great. Uh, very interesting stuff. Um, I was thinking about, uh, you know, you're on the research side of this. Um, and you said uh, at the beginning um, something to the effect that this kind of habitat removal is still happening. Oh, yeah. And, and even though you have, you know, you're demonstrating very well, you know, that, that it's not as big of an issue. What do you see on the, um, the side of, you know, where are the, the entry points for successfully changing minds and mindsets? And I know that may be out of your realm as a researcher, but what do you think about that for changing how things get done on farms to yeah. reduce that occurring? Totally. And so the, it's never been, um, the growers, right? It's never been coming from the growers in all of my years working. Everyone is, you know, very, very accepting of these findings. And it's intuitive to lots of the growers that we talk to. They're like, yeah, we know this is the case, but our buyers um, require that we do this practice. They send the auditors out to the farm field. A lot of times these are these uh, audits that are really not transparent and they require us to remove our hedgerows or things like that. And we're stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? So clearly the solution is convincing the buyers. And that has been really hard to even get the buyers in the room. Uh, we've tried through a variety of different ways for years and years. And the danger about like going through a regulatory approach, just saying like, well, you can't remove habitat, you can't do these things, is that then the growers get really screwed. They get kind of place between this rock and a hard place, right? Where they're like, maybe they lose their buyers and we don't want that, right? So it's really important to be empathetic to, to the growers in this situation. I'll say that there is right now a lot of movement on this front, more, more movement than I've seen in, in the last decade that I've worked on this, where there's sort of a self-organized group of people, including many of the people on this call um, that are really interested in kind of putting together a coalition to, to get a bunch of the community together in terms of growers and food safety folks come to common ground and get eventually the buyers in the room. Um, so you can see, you know, there, there are folks here in the room that you could reach out to about joining that group. Uh, Eric Morgan's in the room, Katie Giapuzzo, who's also in the room too, are, are helping co-lead that effort. And a lot of this was done by sort of Tom's leadership, who's also in the room right now. So um, there's movement there if you want to join up or if other people do as well. Thank you. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. And maybe one of you guys, if you want to throw, uh, and one of you guys who I just called out, if you're here, if you want to throw out a, an email or something, if anyone wants to get in contact with you, that could be useful. Great. Thank you. What other questions or comments might folks have? 
thanks. Katie just put that email in the her email in the chat. So thanks, Katie. Danny, what are some of your next steps? Um, what are my next steps? It's tricky, honestly, uh, on the food safety side of things. I don't really think that much more science needs to be done for the food safety and the uh, non-crab habitat stuff. Like at this point, I mean, I really feel like we know the answer, right? Um, I'm always curious in talks like this for people to to kind of bring up issues to me. I mean, that's my job as a scientist is sort of to like figure out what the interesting questions are. Some people have expressed some interest in understanding birds roles at like different stages, not in the field. So like around packing facilities or uh, plants or things like that. So there's, so that might be interesting to th look at. Um, thinking outside of just food safety concerns, there's a lot to know about pest pressure and uh, non-crop habitat role in that. And we've got some upcoming projects looking at, um, non-crop vegetation um, and flowering plants integration into farm fields in, you know, at a large scale in the central coast that's gonna be coming online in the next year or so, but much more of thinking about it from a pest standpoint. And we'll probably take a, a little bit of, of bird and, um, and poop data just to, to reconfirm that we're not seeing anything else with that. But yeah, I think that's probably where we're going. But if anyone has anything in the room that, they, that they're dying to know or, or would help them as they're thinking about farming looking forward and food safety, definitely let me know. Feel free to reach out. Thank you. There's a question in the chat asking, how do food safety certifiers differ from buyers on biodiversity uh, issues? Tom, you probably know this answer better than I do. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't know the, like, the world that you guys live in in terms of all of that regulation certification. I, yeah, I have no idea whether the certifiers um, are, change, are so different um, and by certifiers, I you mean I'll, I bet you you mean some of these like large auditor groups that um, like the NSF and other firms like that. Um, I know like you know the CCF CCOF folks and um, are totally on board with a lot of things that we're talking about and saying here. But I think the big issue, as I said before, is is when you have these buyers that have their own metrics, these proprietary standards that they're telling their auditors to go out and enforce. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Um, there's some possible research topics proposed, um, including wetlands as habitat yeah. type. That would be pretty interesting. Um, yeah, with all of the ducks and geese that it attracts. And how does that change uh, the food safety risks? Yeah, and like, you know, I will say that the that the survival of pathogens in poop was absolutely highest for the Canada geese, right? So that was the that was the one that we tested in terms of the large waterfowl, and they poop the biggest poops, um, and so they have and they have the longest survival. So yeah, I think that is that is a good good idea is thinking about some of this stuff with the wetlands and water associated birds. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. I launched a evaluation of our talk today. We appreciate any of your input. Um, any more questions? I have a question if others um, aren't prepared to jump in. So, um, uh, oh, go Thank ahead. You. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Thank you for sharing the uh, lecture. Uh, I wish you focus uh, next lectures insects or fungus on strawberry. Damage. Yeah, insects or fungus on strawberry damage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so we studied the we studied insects a bunch for the bird. Or oh, sorry, was there more? Not, I didn't mean to interrupt you. 
Okay. Yeah. So we studied insects a bunch in the bird study, but it was much more about like the role of birds controlling these uh, the insects um, and not so much of the insects are themselves. I mean, the big thing to, con to be concerned about with strawberries is the, uh, is um, ligus, right? And so, and the damage from ligus was just so much more than the birds. Um, and I don't think we saw, trying to remember if we saw any habitat effects on ligus directly. I'd have to go back and look at that. Um, I don't, the next big project we're doing is gonna be looking at um, insects on, on leafy greens. So sadly not strawberries, but yeah, I had a great time working on strawberries. So going back to strawberries again would be fun in the future. Thank you, it's awesome, awesome topic. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I had a question. It sounds like most of your work has taken place on the Central Coast. Um, do you expect much, like how influential are the variables of climate and the crop dynamics, um, you know, looking at this work in, in the Central yeah. Valley and, and other um, growing environments? Yeah, so we're doing different things things around here. Um, so we've got a big rice project right now looking at integrating rice, uh, uh, fish and birds into rice fields, that is water birds, and looking at impacts on, uh, you know, methane emissions and on um, rice production and nutrient recycling, a bunch of stuff like that. Um, so we've got that kind of work. We've also got a big vineyard study um, in Napa Valley looking at birds and nest boxes and vineyards and pest control. That's all about pest regulation and habitat around farm fields and actually movement and of birds and, and things like that. So we do have that stuff. Um, in terms of like, you know, vegetable production, food safety stuff, um, I guess we've centered on the central coast just because that's where so much of that is happening, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of this pressure is happening. Yeah, I will say there's a good study looking at hedgerows around here um, in Yolo County um, and looking at rodent intrusion and showing that having hedgerows around didn't actually create more rodents bringing pathogens onto farm fields. So that sort of aligned with what we were finding. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, no immediate plans to do like a the, the replicate like the same sort of stuff as, around here. I don't have a big sense that it would be too different and a lot of our all of our survival pathogen survival stuff that was in Yolo County we were doing that here at UC Davis so yeah great. I think probably pretty anal pretty similar great thank you wonderful well you can take a look at the chat you have many thanks from folks and um, thank you all for coming to the seminar series today and uh, we'll be here again for three, four more sessions, um, Tuesdays, 12 to one. And you can shoot me an email if you have any questions. We use the same Zoom link each time. So you can save that. And um, I think that's it. That was a really fantastic talk, Danny. Um, really digestible. And um, I think for folks who are both new and familiar with the topic, it was um, really valuable. Thanks so much. And thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. And have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.